Welcome to another edition of The Christ Life. Glad that you're joining us today. Of course, uh, we always enjoy bringing it to you, obviously, since I have the full table. Uh, Rex is not with me again this week. He may be out in another couple weeks, but uh, but I'm with you and I'm glad that you're with me as we continue to talk about The Christ Life and specifically in the area of growth. And if you'll remember the very first uh, really connect that we wanted to do for the entire sermon series just simply is this. It's not what you do, it's what you discover. And in a world where we are trying to do so many different things, uh, we we superimpose that upon our Christianity and think, I got to try, I've got to try, I've got to try. And we find that we fail, we fail, we fail. When actually there's a beauty that happens when we discover. When we discover that, and it, it doesn't matter if it's discovering, discovering biblical truths, discovering things about God, or even discovering things in science class, it has a much greater impact than just this rote learning that you're doing over and over and over again. I want to start off today uh, bringing to your attention a place called Valladolid, Spain. In this a place in Spain, there is a monument that has been built for, uh, for Christopher Columbus. It was the place that he died in 1506. And he, it was here that uh, this monument that they put up had a very interesting component to it. Uh, you, what you find is that there is this lion that is moving up the, uh, the monument, and it is taking a bite out of one word uh, of a common uh, motto that was in Spain's history. The motto is this, it's uh, ni plus ultra, meaning no more beyond. And so what the, the lion depicts is taking a bite out of the word ni or no. So it went from no more beyond to more beyond or plus ultra. Because for the Spaniard, they understood that Christopher Columbus proved there was more beyond. Now, what does that have to do with what we're talking about today? Well, I think it has everything to do with everything we talk about the Christ life, because the Christ life is the essence of more beyond. When Jesus was uh, operating in his ministry that the Father uh, had for him, he, he was always moving, knowing that there were not walls. There was more beyond what the eye can see. And I think that's a big part of what we're going to talk about today as we talk about trustworthiness. Now, I want to start by reading in Matthew chapter 6, um, part of Jesus's discourse on the Sermon on the Mount. So let's pick it up in Matthew chapter 6 as Jesus is, is part of the discourse that Jesus gives on the Sermon on the Mount. He says this, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to this to a span of, his, of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor um, spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient, um, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, when you think about these words coming out of Jesus' uh, mouth, our minds tend to immediately get this picture um, of him by the seashore and giving the words. And if you're looking at the from the seashore, you're seeing the people sit on the hills and there are these grassy hills. And, uh, and, and this is certainly not wrong because that was typical of where Jesus started out in Galilee. But you also have to understand that certainly the people who were reading these words first after uh, Matthew penned them, uh, were people that were, in 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 some respects, uh, much different than even you and I could imagine. The, there were people that were living in conditions that were 
so foreign for us where there was limited water supply, the sanitation was horrible, there, there was an incredible density of, of not just humans, but also of animals. Uh, they lived in these, what were, were really uh, tenement cubicles where there was this, you know, they were, they were smoky and they were dark and, and they were damp and they were always dirty. And there was certainly smells of, of sweat and urine and feces and, and, and really the decay was just permeated everywhere. But that probably was a little bit better than outside on the streets where there was mud and there was open sewers, there was manure, there were crowds. In fact, there were even human corpses. I mean, there, there, um, uh, there were adults and that in some cases there were even children that would die and, and be pushed off onto the streets and abandoned. So uh, for us, we don't, we don't necessarily think about that when we read the text. And of course, it wasn't just poor people. It wasn't just mainly the people that I just described, even though they were certainly a big segment of the early Christians. There, there were people that were wealthy and there were people who were farmers and, and there certainly were the, the, the open, you know, uh, landscapes and all those other things. But for the people who were the poorest of the poor, the people who literally would wake up every day and think about, uh, okay, how am I going to get my meal? Or, now that we have planted all the seeds that are available to, to this, how are we going to make sure that there are seeds for next season? All, all of the different uh, things that they experience are really for us to understand that in all ages and in all periods of life, there has been never a shortage of things for people to worry about. So Jesus helps the disciples understand that it's not uh, that that regardless of our circumstances, whether in com complete poverty or in places of even wealth, that we actually don't have to live a, an anxious, worryful, worrisome life, that we can live securely. I want you to get this. This is critical. We can live securely in our everyday challenges. We're not secured by our challenges. We're secured because we serve a trustworthy God. We, we are in relationship with a trustworthy God. We, we have a God who really does care more about us than everything else in creation. And so what happens is when we find ourselves where worry begins to get in front of us, it, it really is bringing us back to a place where we are uh, this, this uh, no more beyond because the worry becomes this wall. And when we think about this, this worry, then, um, then all of a sudden we have to decide what we're going to do with it. It's gonna, we're all going to be confronted with it, but what are we going to do with it? And ultimately, when we know that we serve a trustworthy God and that this trustworthy God that we're in relationship cares for us and loves us immensely, then all of a sudden we can say, wait a minute, it's not no more beyond. It, it's now more beyond. I can move beyond it. My life can advance. I can move into the fullness of the Christ life that I desire. I think some of you need to understand this thing about worry, because I want you to stop for a moment and just do a, a bit of inventory about the things that you worry about. What is it you worry about? You worry about your marriage. You worry about your family. You worry about your job. You worry about your bank account. You worry about your retirement. You worry about your health. What is it that you worry about? Because here's the thing, the thing that you worry about the most, you trust God about the least. Let me say that again for you. The things that you worry about the most, you actually trust God about the least. And I believe that as we grow in this Christ life, that we, uh, we get to a place where we discover something. Remember, now this is the connect part. I said every week we're going to discover something. I believe that there's this ongoing part of growth where we discover that God is trustworthy. And it doesn't matter where we're at in life, there's always yet another discovery that God is trustworthy. And when we discover that God is trustworthy, it takes down the wall that, that kept us from moving beyond, that now lets us go, I'm going to go more beyond. I'm going to go beyond the places that I've gone before. And so really what you find is that in the Christ life, as you discover this, there are some uh, attitudinal changes that happen in you and I. There, 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 are some, there are some very common attitudes that in this portion of scripture that Jesus is bringing out. And the, the first, and there are, first of all, there are, there are attitudes always about the future. Worry is always about the future. 
And so th- there's an attitude that some people, and maybe it's you that take that, that they're really apathetic or you don't care about the future. I'm going to live in the moment and I'm going to ignore because I don't care what's coming tomorrow. I don't care what's coming next year. I don't even care about when I die. I'm just going to live this. Well, that certainly is a worldly attitude that we believe that Christ is going to help us overcome that kind of attitude. Another really common attitude that people have is really a fretful, anxious attitude where there, there's never an ability to settle. Before I became a follower of Christ, uh, the fretful, anxious attitude that filled my heart caused me the smoke. I, I, I could have been a, he's a, probably was at some points a chain smoker because my, I always had this, this part of my heart that was fretful about what was going to come next. And the devil has a good way of uh, really helping shape our minds into all of the problems of the past, uh, reminding us that these are going to be the same problems in the future. And so we're constantly worrying about the things that are going to come up. Another attitude that we just quite honestly have to move by is a fearful attitude. It's really this panicky attitude. It's the, it's the kind of attitude where there's never a place where there's a settling about uh, tomorrow. It's always looking out for the next problem. It's always looking out for the next hurt. It's always looking out for the next uh, thing that's going to be said that's going to be hurtful or painful. It's looking out, uh, expecting to get fired from the next job, whatever that is. And you live in this, in this perpetual state of panic. Well, that's not a godly attitude. That's a worldly attitude. That is not a, uh, an attitude that Christ ever had. But then I think that certainly in our culture where where we have everything so well supplied for us, where we don't have to be concerned as much about the the things that are in the streets. When In fact, when we were uh, missionaries on the Apache Indian Reservation, we would be driving down and, and as a family in a car, we would, uh, we would make these jokes. We would be driving down and there would be a DD. We even had a, uh, a DH. Uh, and you're like, well, what is that? Well, the DD would be a dead dog. Uh, we even came across a dead horse. Uh, there was dead deer, dead elk, dead all sorts of things. And the reason we saw all those things is because on the reservation, they don't have the sanitary pickups like we have uh, in, in cities around America. And so uh, if for, for some people, uh, they, uh, uh, they, uh, they recognize that there are these issues, there are these problems out here, but, but, but in our culture, we don't, we don't even see those kinds of things. It's easy for us to have a, a self-assured attitude. And a self-assured attitude is just very simply, it's the man who said, I'm just making so much money, I've got to build bigger barns. And, and, and he didn't realize that he was never going to need any of that stuff. But in our own self-assurance, we think we can, we will frame our future. We will make sure that we have what we are is due us or we're supposed to have. And so the self-assured attitude ultimately never discovers the trustworthiness of God because that that attitude doesn't put us in a position where we continually grow and need God's trustworthiness. But really where you want to be in the Christ life is to really have a calm, God-centered attitude that really is a trusting attitude. That's really where we want to be. And just from a logical standpoint, I don't care if you're apathetic, if you're fretful, if you're fearful, or you are self-assured in your attitude, the most logical thing to put your trust um, into is the God of heaven. It just makes no sense to put it anywhere else because anywhere else throughout history has failed and has ultimately come to an end. But God, in Jesus's words, has really said, you and me, we're of the highest order. We're higher than the birds. We're more beautiful than the than the plants. There's nothing more uh, important that and and the more anything that God values more than you and I. And so it just makes sense to place our trust in Him. Well, how do we do that? Well, that's the grow piece, uh, and and how we do that simply is starting with a God reality. It's easy for us to live a life where we segment things. We've got work life, we've got family life, we've got God life. But when you grow in the God reality, then God is every part of life. But it starts with just a fundamental understanding that few people and few Christians ultimately get to. And it's this, God is God. God doesn't need you and I. Uh, God, God's not going to, to go, uh, well, oh, bummer, you know, any of that kind of stuff. He's God. And, and, and so because he's God, 
then he is absolute. I know there are people, they're out there, God, you know, why did he do this? And blah, 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 if he was so loving, all of this. Well, when you understand that he is God, you're a little less apt to go, who does he think he is? And so while that's normal for us, we may not say that outright, but our actions sure show that. Uh, we grow in this God reality where God is in every part of our life and he's permeating every uh, um, part of our life. He is in the beginning, he is in the now, and he is in the future. He created all things and he's going to judge all things. And as I grow in that and I expand in that, then all of a sudden the things of this world begin to lose their hold. They begin to lessen. When I find myself, like you find yourself in places where we are um, we are uncertain about the future and we wonder if really there is a God because of our circumstances, when we, when we go, grow in the God reality, we recognize that he is in me and he is with me, that he has not left me and he's not abandoned me. And so when I begin to grow in that reality, there is a peace that begins to surround me in the middle of chaos and in the middle, in the middle of problems and in the middle of conflict. Why? Because I'm growing constantly in this God reality. But I want to take it a step further. And it's this, that God is completely and totally in control. He's not, he's not up in heaven going, oh boy, this got messed up. Oh no, we're in trouble here. No, he is in completely of control in everything that happens. And by control, I don't mean that he is up there as the puppet master doing this kind of thing. If remember the puppets on the strings, that's not what's taking place. He understands that this, the enemy is doing this. And the only reason they're able to do this is he's allowing it. Now, the Bible says he allows that and he uses all things together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. So even while the enemy will do things to try to bring worry and, and pain and uncertainty into our hearts, when we grow in the God reality that he's in control, then I know that he is going to move even at the most base level at food and clothing. Now, that's, that's important because that's what Jesus is bringing out, is that we don't have to get a fixation on how am I, because we can trust and know that he already is. And so that, that's part of that growth period, is growing in that God reality. But the, a part, of it, part of it also is growing in a God initiative. Uh, when you go on the God reality, you're moving away from the life focuses of survival and now moving into going, wait a minute, God has something significantly bigger for my life than just trying to figure out what to, where to, where to live, where to eat and what to put on. He's got something much more significant. And so I move into this mission of God where his initiative is to seek and save. Now my focus doesn't have to be about me. It now becomes about others. Who has he put in the circle of my life that he's calling me to begin to pray for and to begin to minister to? Because not only does he desire to seek and save them, but now because I'm others focused, now there's a sanctifying that he desires to do. So now we, we use words like discipling. We disciple people into a life that is better reflected to the life of Jesus. It's his initiative. It's what he desires to do. Jesus says, go into all the nations and, and uh, making disciples. And that's this part here where we are making disciples. And then, then ultimately what we're doing is we are, we're doing that last part of the initiative where we ourselves are sending them. Now, this is completely a different focus than what we just read about in Matthew chapter 6. And, and it only has gotten as we grow in this trustworthiness of God, where we trust him more and more. The other part of the growth piece comes in God's provision. So we've got God, we grow in the God reality and we grow in God's initiative, but we also grow in his provision. Do you know what the number one provision that God wants for you and I? It's not food. Uh, it's not clothing. Uh, it, it's not even where you're going to sleep. It's more of him. It's more of him. God desires that you and I are focused. That Jesus says, seek, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God understands that when we grow in his provision, we're growing in him. And it's in this growing in him that you and I have to understand that it looks different. His provision rarely looks like what you're going to see on TV. His provision isn't going to be, come from Edward Jones. Now, Edward Jones may be a Friday service, but the ultimate provision that we get from God is him. And, and, and in that, he's going to supply everything else that we have need of. 
And so it may, it's not going to look like a, a portfolio. It's not going to look like even, even sometimes in a paycheck. Years ago, I think about when Clarissa and I, our family was young. We had very little money. Uh, we uh, um, didn't even have enough money to pay for insurance. I was in a sales job. And our, uh, we, we went on a Saturday to a, a water park and we literally walked out of the locker room getting ready to go to our first, uh, first ride. And our daughter of uh, two or three years old falls flat on her face and her bottom teeth go through her bottom lip. All of a sudden we find ourselves in the emergency room, her having to get stitches. And all of a sudden I am confronted with worry because how are we going to pay for this? We didn't have insurance. Well, we go home and it was a time later that I don't even remember what I was owed and maybe I forgot it, don't even know, but a check showed up in my mail for exactly the amount that was owed the emergency room. See, God's provision doesn't always look like uh, the American way of looking of, through insurance, for example. God, But here's the thing, God always provides first more of him and then he provides everything else that we have needed. Why, why is that important? When you understand and grow in God's provision of him, it's the only thing that is truly eternal. As we grow in God and we grow in this provision that is given to us of more of him, then all of a sudden eternity is growing in us. Eternity is growing in its greater reality. So now, even when we get to the place where I know there are people that they're so confident that they're ready to go see Jesus, it's only because they're not in the hospital bed literally taking their last breath. I've been in the hospital rooms where the panic on a person's face is evident, where they said, I'm a Jesus follower of their lives, but there was no growth in the trustworthiness because they never discovered that God is trustworthy. And so now they're, they're, they're confronted with the greatest concern that every living person ever has that comes to their mind. What's going to happen after I die? But when you grow in the trustworthiness and you get more and more of Jesus, then you literally are at a place like uh, a young lady that was on the Apache reservation. Her name, I just knew her by Sister Cora. Was, I don't even know how old she was. She just came to church one Sunday and she says, well, this is my last day. I'm going to go be with Jesus. And on Monday, she passed away in perfect peace and a perfect rest. Why? Because she had grown in her uh, discovery throughout life that God really is trustworthy. And in every one of those circumstances, God provided more of him. So when it was time for her to, to really reach the pinnacle of everything that anybody ever worries about, for her, she knew, get this, there was more beyond. And so when we, we come to this go piece, here's what it really looks like in everyday life. This is really where the, the rubber meets the road. It really comes to a place where we're constantly reciting all the things that and all the reasons that God is trustworthy. Now, you may survey your current life and you may not find any. If that's you, it's okay. The Bible is filled with them. You can say, God, you were, you were trustworthy to Abraham in promising a son. God, you were trustworthy to Abraham when you said that his descendants would number the, the stars in the sky. God, you were, you were uh, trustworthy to David when you anointed him with oil to be king of Israel. You've always shown yourself to be trustworthy. And I believe you're going to show yourself to be trustworthy in this situation. And here's the thing. He will. He'll show himself to be trustworthy and you're going to get on the other side. And here's what you need to do when you're on the other side. You need to begin to recite all the places in, in your life where God has shown himself to be trustworthy. When you do that, now, I'm not a big journaler. I journal for seasons and then I stop. But whenever there's, when I'm ever I'm, I'm up against something big that would tend to cause me to to want to worry or have anxious or 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 even come to a, I can get this done a self assured attitude, and I get to the other side and I find that God was trustworthy, I always write that down because I because I know that there's yet another something coming. Because the reality of life is you're either about to go into a problem, in the middle of a problem, or just coming out of a problem. Well, when you actually write down and make note of God's trustworthiness, then you can then go back to them. And when worry is standing in front of you and, and the, the motto of your life of past is no more beyond, you can take and, and say, the lion, the tribe of Judah has bitten away that no. And I know there is more beyond because I know that and have discovered time and time again that God is trustworthy. Now, 
for, for maturity and growth is now you begin to, uh, it starts by reciting, but then you got to start risking. Now, when, you, when you're seeking after the kingdom of God, now you're get, putting yourself in a position where the kingdom's going to be expanded. And there's no expanding the kingdom unless you are trusting God, which means you're coming up to the edge of your ability. You're coming up to the edge of your know-how. You're coming up to the edge of your plan. And now you're saying, God, it's in your hands. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to live today knowing that you've got even later today taken care of and tomorrow. And so I'm putting it in your hands. And the more we do that, the kingdom of God is expanded. It's extended in our own lives. And what happens there is we grow and we go from risking to now we're radiating. Now we're we're radiating a peace that is not a worldly peace. It's not a peace that can be purchased. It's not a peace that can, that can come by having a certain amount of money in your uh, bank account. It's not a peace that can be put on like, a, like a piece of clothing. It's a piece that surpasses all understanding. Why? Because you've grown in, in, in the trustworthiness of God because you keep discovering it. And now the peace of God that surpasses all understanding truly is guarding your heart. And it begins to show, it begins to radiate from our lives. But beyond that, it begins to uh, radiate the rest that comes of knowing that our heart and our life and our, our full being is fully in his hands. And that we don't have to manipulate it or control it, but God is well able. Why do I know that? Because I've discovered his trustworthiness. I've discovered that in this particular semester says there's a reality of God. I understand that uh, that not only is there a reality of God, but he has a plan and purpose. He has an initiative that he is working here. And then when I come out of the other side, he will provide been providing me with more of him. So now I'm at rest. And more than at rest, I'm living a rejoicing rejoicing life. I can lift my eyes in praise and worship and adoration to the Most High God because I know that He has it well in hand. And so in the midst um, of, of even being in the jail like Paul and Silas were, they were rejoicing and singing. Why? Because they had discovered God's trustworthiness. And they grew to a place where no more was it knee plus ultra, no more beyond. For the person who's living the Christ life, it is more beyond. And that is our prayer for you. God, take down the walls that each person might discover your trustworthiness in their circumstance today so they can live a life that truly is more beyond in Jesus' name. God bless you guys. I hope that this time together has been a blessing to you and it doesn't have to end here. You can listen to last week's sermon on Facebook, YouTube, or the podcast. Once again, thank you for making the time to connect and choosing to be here. Let us know in the chat if you would like to get further involved in one of our life groups. God bless you, and we hope to see you here next week.